got three great speakers. First up is Thomas Cartinson, Senior Vice President for Global Trading at Arla. Second, we have David Buchanan, Senior Corporate Vice President of Cargill International. And third, Joanne Denny Finch, Chief Executive of IGD. First up, I'd like to welcome Thomas Cartinson. Please welcome. Good afternoon. It's always wonderful to get the first shift just after lunch. <laughs> um, you have to learn a new word today. It's called VUCA. It stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, it can also say it's a cat's all for it's crazy out there. Um, so first I would like to thank uh, NFU for uh, inviting me. Um, to speak. I've been asked to talk about markets and trends and also volatility. In short, I'm placed in Arla Foods. I've been in the dairy business for the last 30 years. Uh, and if I make some mistakes in my English, I apologize for it already now. Uh, it's not my native language. Um, I'm responsible for collection of milk. I'm responsible for planning and optimization and then of course for our trading. Uh, I will not make too many comparisons about what is going on in ALA, but just in very brief, uh, ALA is a cooperative. Uh, we have, uh, this year, we have 13.4 billion kilo of milk in intake. We have owners in eight countries. Uh, we have decided to operate in pounds, euros, Swedish krona, Danish krona, uh, just to make it a little bit complicated for ourselves. Um, and we have a turnover of a little bit above 10 billion uh, euro. So what is it all about at the moment? What is happening? Uh, and how do we see it going forward? I have chosen this picture just to start the day. I know I'm an island today, but I have to assure you that you are not an island in the world market. You're actually a big part of it. And we have to see where we're we going next. Where are we in Europe? What are we going to? Which market are we going to export to? Where are we going to sell our milk? And we have to look to the east. There are more people living in that little circle than in the rest of the world. I think that is a little bit to think about, that we have India, we have China, Philippines, Indonesia, all big countries with a lot of people and a lot of growth. To be honest, in Northern Europe or in Europe in general, None of us really need to eat more. Some of us need to eat a little bit less. Um, so we, we have to look out where to do, what to do when milk quota disappears and we want to grow our businesses. Our strategy, this is a one pager. Develop the core. As you can see, we have home markets. We don't have a home market, we have home markets. We have the UK, of course, a very important market. Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Germany, and the Netherlands. And of course, we want to stay in the core. We want to develop our markets. We want to maintain our markets here. We want to build. We want to expand. But at the same time, we also know that if we are going to have, or we are going to have more milk, we have to find places where to sell this milk. And there we're selling, delivering the growth. The growth will be in Africa, Middle East, Asia, Russia, until 8th of August last year. Uh, but uh, for sure, I think it will come back. This is the markets which we want to be in, where we have to develop uh, our, our products. Secondly, being a multinational cooperative means that we have to utilize our milk across borders. We have to utilize our production. We don't want to make more CapEx investment than necessary. So if we can export out of UK to China, we can change production in Germany. We are doing that in order to optimize our earnings. We have to do it simpler. We have to make it accessible across all countries. And then we just have to be leaner. And that is not a personal uh, issue. Uh, it is more in general that we have to ensure that we are efficient. So trend number one, 92% of the dairy growth in the period 2012 to 2020 will be happening in emerging markets. So developed markets, uh, although sometimes we doubt it, we are still in EU part of the developed markets. 
Uh, we can question ourselves when we listen to what's happening in Greece. But we are still a part of developed markets. And as you can see, there will be a growth of almost nothing. 3 billion euro in retail sales over an eight year period. 60% of the growth in retail business will be in the emerging markets. So in order to capture that, we have to be in the emerging markets. We have to be there with the right, uh, right products, the right setup in order to meet the markets. It's difficult to see in the picture, but that picture is actually from uh, Abidjan and in uh, West Africa. Uh, there's a small truck from Dano, which is one of our brands, selling uh, milk powder in the wholesale market. That's how it looks. This is the markets which we have to be ready for also going forward. Nigeria is another market in that area. They estimated that for, uh, still 30 years from now, Nigeria will have the same number of people as the United States today. It will be a huge market. We have to be there, and we have to be there already now. That is part of the Arla Foods um, going outside and delivering the growth. We have to be in these markets. Trend number two, we will see more milk. Uh, it's not, we can say that we already had the general addition or uh, practice uh, last year where we saw milk intake increasing in Europe by 4.7%. I think if we look at the UK and go back three, four years, and I've asked you, will you be able to produce 10% more milk? I think most of you have looked at me and said, no, of course not, it's not possible. We have all kinds of restriction. And although in 12 months from 13 to 14, you produce 10% more milk. We have farms in Denmark. The average yield per cow in Denmark is 10,000 kilo. Uh, the first prize this year went to a farmer with 296 cows who had an average yield of 15,022 kilo per cow. That's a 50% difference from the average. Then you can ask well, how he's doing it, etc. But it just showed that there's a tremendous opportunities when they are getting out of quota. I know in EU, in, West, in, in Denmark, North Germany, Holland, they have been more or less on quota more or less every year since 1986. So when you tell the farmer now by 1st of April, you can go out on your farm, you can be as efficient as you want to be in order to grow your production. I think we will start seeing figures and a yield increase of 4 to 5 percent is probably what, one of the, what some of them is looking at. Another big economy of course in the world market is the US. Uh, US have historically been around 3 percent. Uh, we see that they are variating a lot uh, more uh, than many of others. They are very more, they are really quick to adjust, to adjust their milk production to uh, demand. Uh, not something that we are very good at in Europe, or I don't think we will get down the U.S. way. That's another story. Uh, but the U.S. is there. Um, and then, of course, you have New Zealand. Uh, they are saying at the moment, in February, Fonterra had 6% less milk. Uh, than uh, last year in the same period. On the North Island, they had 9% less milk here in February. And that is helping, and that is, we have to understand it, we have to know what is happening. Because that is driving prices in the world market. Top exporters is still mainly EU. It's Australia, New Zealand, United States, and, uh, and uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Uruguay. In 14, they had 3.9% growth. It was probably a little bit too much, taking into consideration that the world trade is probably growing with two and a half. So that is also the result we are seeing right now, or we saw in the summer, or during 14, where export was plumbing, prices were coming down. 15, we are just looking at 1.1% at the moment, and that is helping to stabilize prices, and maybe increase them a bit. Trend number three, volatility, it's a global dairy market. Um, as you can see, this is uh, purely stolen from Rabobank, uh, but the uh, U.S., back in September, they were actually having a milk price of 48 euro cents. At the same time, we saw a dollar starting increasing in value, uh, and uh, export out of the U.S. became very really difficult. Um, the uh, U.S. had replaced New Zealand as the uh, supplier of cheddar uh, coming into Europe. 
now is probably back to the New Zealand. Uh, export almost, almost stopped. And right now, we can, they estimated that in March months, prices in the US would be 26 cents. On the other hand, we are on the way up because we actually managed to take good advantage of the high US prices and an improved dollar rate. We had a small accident with Russia back in August, as you remember, which released probably anywhere between 50 and 70,000 tons of cheese into the European market almost overnight. We lost 25 to 30,000 tons of export per month to Russia. I'm quite sure when we start to see, when we see the January export figures, export out of Europe to other markets, being Mexico, uh, North Africa, Asia, will probably hit anywhere between 22 and 26,000 tons, meaning that the Russian export has been replaced with export to other markets. And that is also helping stabilizing the market at the moment. There's a roller coaster on this picture. And uh, normally a question we always get, or I'm getting at least, is where are we on the roller coaster? Are we on the way down? Are we at bottom? Are we just on this long, nice start of the roller coaster where you're being dragged up to the top? Uh, I would say it's difficult to say at the moment. Uh, we definitely see a lot of improvements in the markets. Uh, we have seen the DDT go up here on the last uh, yeah, five auctions, but it definitely in the last two auctions, a significant increase. Um, but we also know that, uh, that we don't see China yet as a player in the world market. They are not participating really. Uh, they, still have, uh, they still have too much uh, stock uh, in, in their own inventory. Uh, mid price have come down in China, in China, so we believe that they will come back. Uh, but sometimes a belief is also something that you would like to believe. Uh, we still think that end of this year, in quarter three and quarter four, we should see China coming back into the market starting ordering products. But that is just talking about volatility, and it's going up and down, and uh, we don't really know what, what to do about it. Um, and to some extent, that is also this, this is also a situation for us. Um, how are we managing volatility, and how should you as a farmer managing volatility when it comes to dairy prices? You can say that in, in Europe, we have all kinds of dairy companies. We have one market, one product. It can be a niche product. It can be very nice to be in that niche product. Uh, on the other hand, it is also difficult to envision that you can actually grow your own production and that dairy will be able to take it. You can have few markets, few products. Uh, gives a little bit more spread. Uh, you can be in cheese in the UK market, uh, maybe also in fresh milk. Uh, but you're not really into powder. You're not really into uh, other industrial or whey products. But, so you are more, much more demanding or depending on how one market develops. And then you can have a, a broad assortment of products and a global sales. For sure, in Isle of Foods, that is the way we look at it. We are seeing ourselves as a global company uh, with a global footprint. We have export. Now it's saying 80 markets. With the last count, it was actually closer to 100 markets. Uh, but we have sales office in 30, office, in, in 30 countries around the globe. And we are doing our utmost always to optimize our milk. And when we optimize in milk, that is across borders. That is, you know, I have to say, we are not transporting a lot of milk, neither from the UK or to UK. That is not really feasible. But in Central Europe, between Denmark and Sweden and Germany, we are moving milk across borders in order to optimize the production capacity we have in these places. As you can see, we have a number one position in the UK. We like to maintain that and build on that. Denmark, number one. Sweden, number one. Finland, we are number two. But I will have to say, I have to be honest, we are a little bit behind number one, uh, rather significantly, actually. And the same goes for Netherlands, with Fries and Campina being the dominating there. And then in Germany, number three. So that is more or less our position. We are, we are saying we as a cooperative, we are paying the milk price to our farmers, the same milk price across Europe. We are optimizing 
our production. We try to be in the products which is selling. At the time they're selling, we're building our brands. We are building our private label business. We are doing third party manufacturing when it suits. And then of course, industrial side, we are moving products into what is feasible, what is sellable, and what is giving the best return. Because that is actually the aim for Arla Foods, is to give the best milk price to our farmers in order to facilitate that growth. Thank you. Thomas, I would like to thank you. That was a perfect wake-up call after lunch. And, and now a warm welcome to Dave Buchanan from Cargill. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Birmingham. Um, like the previous speaker, I'd also like to apologize. Uh, English isn't my first language. <laughs> you know where I might be from by my accent. So, um, so volatility, I think, is it here to stay? I'll let you guys decide. But I think if, if the question is how do you manage volatility, the first thing is you have to know something a little bit about it. So how do I turn this? So what I'm going to talk through today, today are where do commodity markets stand today? So give you a state of the union on that. And then why they are likely to remain volatile. So there's something unique about an agriculture market which you're well aware of. So this is looking at price evolution, and it's going back from um, the year 2014. And you can see there are some big winners and some big losers. Uh, the dollar, of course, has been very strong, which doesn't help commodity prices in general, because it's a global market. And then down at the bottom, you've got crude oil, which has a 45% decline year on year. So sometimes people ask the question, is volatility good or is it bad? Well, if you're an oil producer, it's not very good. If you're an oil consumer, it feels all right, right? So those are the things that I think you have to deal with is volatility is going to be there. It is what it is. You try to take it out and you create more. So I think when you look at the three that are in bold, wheat, corn, and soybeans, they are always going to have volatility because why? Because they rely on mother nature to, to come out of the ground. So weather is the big influence on those agriculture commodities that, that are grown in the dirt. Okay, so now a little bit of the State of the Union. So what's going on in the background? Um, how many times faster did the emerging markets develop or advance compared to, to, advanced, uh, to, compared to advanced economies in the seven years um, until today? We heard 92% of the growth going forward is in, is in dairy, is in emerging markets. So GDP growth, it is almost eight times faster that that has been coming out of the emerging markets versus the advanced uh, economies. That is a huge shift that's going on. Is that good for agriculture? Absolutely, positively. People are, are that's one of these mega trends that I'll talk about in a few minutes. What is that role of, of price this price volatility so you think about that why do we have prices change and the real reason for that is we're either trying to build stocks and to, to get to a more comfortable level you do that by encouraging production or um, decreasing consumption and that's via high prices or by low prices you're either tr you're trying to clear stocks and that's to either curtail production or increase consumption so this is the example of what happened in ocean freight markets. So if you look at the period um, until 2005, 2006, freight rates were very low. They're about, for a, for a cape size mark, uh, boat, rent was about $5,000 to $10,000 a day. And then all of a sudden you had China coming, you had China turning on steel production, coal, using more coal, and there was an increase in demand that surged just unbelievable and freight rates went to over $200,000 a day. So from $10,000 to over 200. And so what did that do? People like to own a ship. And so you can see in the, in, these, uh, in the blue bars, that is what is going on in the order book. And that is how many orders are going into the shipyards to have new ships built. Okay, how long does a ship last? 25 years. So. When you make that investment, it's going to be around for a while. It's not like growing corn, 
where you grow it and it, it comes up out of the ground and gets harvested in three or four months, this is something that's going to sail around on the ocean for the next 25 or 30 years. And so you had this huge surge in production, and then what happens? China keeps growing, but you overdo it. You have too much capacity, you have a financial crisis that you can see in 2008, and freight rates crash. So they go back down to four or $5,000 instead of the $200,000 that people had ordered on. There's an interesting little thing here. If you look at the, uh, about 2014, why did we have this big surge in orders again? It's trivia. There's another thing that happens in markets. There's investors. And so investors saw freight rates sit around at four or $5,000 on, on a Cape size boat. And they said, I'll take some of that because they were 200,000 you know, five or six years ago. And so you had a huge order that came out of the financial community and they built more ships. But they didn't change the supply and the demand any, right? So I think there's gonna be some, some boats that sit around at four or $5,000 for a long time because what you did is you put more supply than you do for demand. So this is volatility of the grains that I'm partial to, which are wheat, corn, and soybeans. You can say volatility is down. Yeah, it's down, but these are awfully high levels, right? In order to get to the 50 and 60% volatility that we had a few years back, we had a whole lot of problems agronomically. We had this big uh, surge of, uh, of demand coming out of emerging markets, which will continue. But we have good volatility today, you know, and we will always have that because we rely on Mother Nature. So. What do we call triggers of volatility? And I like to look at it at two different ways. One is you have these big mega trends that are going on. And those are, those are things that last for 25 to 50 years. And those tax the system. They are trying to tell us something. The world is changing. That is the mega trend. And how do you, how do you deal with that? The other thing that we talk about is what we call a disruptor. And that can come in a number of different forms that I'll talk about in a few minutes. The outcome of that is volatility. So another background, let's look at stocks of, of grains and uh, oil seeds. It looks like we're going up, but if you look back, it's only in the past 10 years that we've been lower than we are today, and what have prices done? Okay, so we're on the cusp. If you wanna go back to find something that, where we were lower than that, you have to go back to the early 70s when you had what they, some people refer to as the Soviet grain robbery, when they took a lot of imported a lot of grain out of the US and prices went very high. So we are at a level where production matters. So we rely on, on we're only one crop problem away from a real problem in price. So what are those mega trends? We talk about economics, uh, demographics. I look, look at agriculture supply and that's really this trend of technology that comes in. And then as far as the, uh, that's, so that's your supply and then on the demand, you have two things going at you. One is the climate, so what, is, what does that impact on, on, the, on the trend of production and consumption? There's also some things on technology for demand. So we have a group of analysts in the, in the business that, businesses that I'm in charge of, and there's about 100 of these people around the world. And they're very fascinating people. It's kind of a cross between a rocket scientist and a, and a farmhand. So they like to, to get in and meddle. And so this is a photograph of the world at night from NASA. And what it is, is it's looking at uh, light emittance at night. So you can see where it's very lit up. You can see Europe. You can see the, the United States. That's where there's a lot of economic activity. Okay? So this gives you an idea of where the population of the world has the money to have economic activity. This is an interesting one. This is the coast of China. So you can see a whole lot of activity here. This is Japan, this is Korea. So what country is this? It's North Korea. Not a whole lot of economic activity there. So what then they do is they, they take those areas and they say, Here are the, here's where we have economic activity and what is the growth potential in those, mar in those markets? Those are called white. That is the Eastern US, Europe, basically you've kind of reached this plateau and that is not the big boom that's going to come when you look at population and movement into the middle class, which are the drivers of consumption. 
So then you come down to the two other colors, which are red and yellow. Red are those areas where you're at that cusp of moving into the middle class, and when you move into the middle class, the consumption goes absolutely straight up because you start consuming more meat. So on conversions of taking grains into meat, you have a multiplier effect, so that is uh, very beneficial to grain and oilseed consumption. The yellow areas are where you're moving people from poverty into staple consumption. So those, that's mainly in, in the African continent. If you take that into further, you, you, you drill into that, there's about a billion people each that'll move into those, that'll be new on the, on the planet Earth, that will be moving into meat consuming uh, incomes or moving into staple consuming incomes. So when I talk about the industry that we're in, I think that's a noble cause. You know, that we have two billion people that are gonna be moving into those areas and that is, we are in a growth business. So it's an old profession that we're in, but it is a growth business. That's an interesting one. Look at the number of people that are coming in the, Indians, in the, in, sub, in the Indian continent, sub, in, subcontinent of India. It's, it's, it's fascinating. So that's where this big population boom comes. Now sometimes, and those are, we call that as dairy, but remember that when you look at India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, you have Hindus which are vegetarian, so not a big meat consumer, but there are about 600,000, 600 million, excuse me, 600 million Muslims, Christians, Jews that are, are located there, which are meat consuming. So that's an interesting one to keep in mind that India does have more potential. The big potential has come because they haven't had the incomes to go with that. So how can we talk about supply? How much world did the corn produce uh, did corn production increase since 1960? From 200 million to uh, 900, so, or uh, 980. So it's really a 800 million uh, increase in production. Now what's interesting is to look at the orange chart on the, on the, on the chart on the left-hand side. Really, um, the amount that's attributed to additional land is not substantial. The big increase has come in the form of increased yields. So when you talk about technology, that is one of those big inputs. It's better inputs that we're putting on in the form of fertilizer, it is seed varieties, it is capacity on the farm. A lot of times people will say the big jump is from GMO. And I say the big jump is because of prices. So as prices got higher, people use more inputs. I grew up on a farm. It used to take us about uh, eight weeks to harvest wheat. And now they do it in about 10 days because they just have more horsepower on the farm. It's precision farming and they can get the job done. Um, it's also interesting to look at this big increase in corn. Where did that come from? It came from two countries mainly, the United States and China. Look at that increase in China, it's impressive. So China today, that increase that China has alone is more than the world produced in 1960. So weather. We, there's a lot of talk of, wa of water and water is a big issue. And being a trader as a background, I oftentimes will say, well quit making it free and then I'll get worried about water. Because in a lot of parts of the world, water is free. This is a, a case of Iran. So Iran has 76 million people and they have 90% of their water going to agriculture. They've had progressively less rain in the northern areas so they don't have this groundwater anymore. And you can see by what happens, so now they're reliant upon what comes out of, the, out of the air versus what comes out of the ground. And look what's happened to their imports. So Iran has become a structural importer. This is just wheat, but if you add corn, oil seeds, it's become substantial. So in order to fix that problem, you know, you can put in a system which allows more efficient use of your water, but that's $100 million, $100 billion, and it takes 10 years. So there are things that are affecting from the climate that we need to be aware of. So the disruptors, we'll talk about weather, geopolitics, and government. So this is looking at the weather, which I said is the mother of all volatility for us. What happened up until about 2008? 
we had a succession of problems in wheat. So you had U.S. wheat problems, Australia wheat problems, Australia again, problems in Europe, problems in Canada, and we had spring wheat prices in Minnesota and the, on the Minneapolis exchange that got over $20 a bushel. Then you had a period of relatively good weather, and that culminated in the 2008 financial crisis, so money came out, and then we start again. So there's an awful lot of weather that goes into our markets. If you look at what's happened in the last three or four years, we have not had much weather. Is that a trend? I don't think so. We're always going to have volatility in the weather. So volatility is here to stay as long as you're growing it out in the ground. Another trigger of volatility. And so we've seen some unusual things happen as we taxed capacity over the last few years. One was we had an elevation in Canada was $120 a ton because you could not get the rail capacity to move it from the interior through minus 40 degree weather to Vancouver to load it on a boat. In Brazil, we've had the same thing with 100, 100 day waiting times in the Brazilian ports to load a bean boat. So that is something that's going to be with us. Again, it's a lot of capital that's going in that should, um, over time, take care of the problem, but it comes, it takes time. Um, this is another, governments make a difference, and they get in and, and have an influence on a market, which isn't always based on economics, it's based upon other inputs. So this is interesting, when you look at China, and you look at the amount of corn stocks that they have, it's 85 million tons, it's actually probably higher than that. Um, China was importing corn not that long ago, and we thought that was the start of when they would show up as a structural importer. Um, but a lot of that has gone into food security it's, and combined with supporting farmer income. So if you look at corn at 84% of world trade is sitting in Chinese stocks, any time that they make some type of a policy change in that, it has an influence and impact on market prices. What is uh, geopolitics? Who's the second biggest uh, grain exporter after the US? It's Ukraine. There's not a lot of, there's a lot of volatility in Ukraine. So it's 3% of world trade, it's 10% of exports. Russia is number four, they're 8% of exports. And you got problems there. So this is just looking at the export market and then saying on the, on the lower chart, it's looking at what that price is in rubles versus what it is in dollars. So the farmer in Russia, you threw on a 35% export tax, and he is getting a price which isn't so favorable for increasing production. So every time that we have one of these issues like this, we aren't giving the signal to the farmer to actually do what he is supposed to do, which is either build stocks or, or decrease stocks in the form of production. There's another influ influence on prices, and that's the financial markets. So this is looking at, in the last years, there's been a big trend about owning a commodity index. And people like that because it was, if you're a pension, pension fund, it was a hedge against inflation. Um, that was kind of the primary thing that they got into. But then they started chasing returns. And in today's world of financial returns, you know, in Switzerland, I think they charge you 1% money to, 1% uh, to store your money for you. Um, people are looking, are chasing returns. So a lot of this index has moved into more what they call an alpha component. So they're looking to take on additional risk to generate a return. So any impact, any, any problem that we have in ag commodities, I think there's plenty of money that will chase that return. So we will have volatility from the financial markets, even though the, the headline is that money's out. So there's a whole lot of things that go into volatility. I think, um, when you look at megatrends, you look at disruptors, that gives a price signal. In order to have effective markets, you really need to have governments behave themselves, let the markets work. And if you do that, you will have balances over time. When you don't have that, and you have market distortions, either in the form of hoarding, the form of, of um, excess subsidies, restrictions on trade, then you're going to end up with chronic imbalances to balance that supply and demand. So 
if you, if you, if you hope for low volatility and, and some sort of a, an intervention that keeps that, over time you will have more volatility than what the market will give you today. How do we look at this as our company? And what we like to look at is three different things. So we look at the fundamental supply and demand, and there's things like weather, um, we use modeling, we look at uh, crop production, the actual demand that we're consuming. And then we look at what we call, that's called fundamentals. We also look at non-fundamentals. So financial uh, players, what is their participation in our markets? You look at volatility analysis, technical analysis, all of those things. And then finally, it's connectivity. So everybody in this room is involved in a business that I'm in. There's no winner or loser. There's, the markets are huge. So we really value you know, valued customers that we have that we can pull um, insights from and, and help to make better decisions on how to deal through what um, the previous person talked about as VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So that's my thing on volatility. Dave, thanks very much. A fascinating insight into not only the challenges, the global challenges, but the opportunities as well. We look forward to taking questions on that. I'd now like to welcome Joanne Denny Finch, who is Chief Executive of IGD, a charity that brings food chain together and helps it to deliver the needs of the public. IGD studies shoppers in the UK and retailers around the world, so we've asked her to talk about what the food chain will be wanting from farmers in future and the opportunities that this will bring. Thank you very much, Minette. Shoppers have enjoyed the fall in food prices, even if farmers haven't. It's a tough period for British farming, but it might not last long. With all of the political uncertainty, international tensions, Europe on the brink, climate change, environmental stress, technology, energy shifts, it could be a very different picture again for food prices this time next year. These are turbulent times, and the theme of this conference is spot on. I'm an optimist, and the evidence I see at IGD points to a very different, but a better future. For farming, the long-term outlook is highly promising, but it won't be a smooth journey, and it won't be a smooth journey for anybody in the food chain. Today, I'd like to talk about two parts of the chain undergoing dramatic change, shoppers and retailers. I'll cover what's changing and why and how you can turn this to your advantage. In normal times, food shoppers are creatures of habit. They buy mostly the same things in the same places each week, and they do that every week. And of course, the supermarkets have over time claimed the biggest share. But two things changed to jolt people out of their habits, a recession and an explosion of new information. Frugal became the new cool, although people were hunting down value and not just the lowest price. Shoppers never stop caring about quality. All of us want the best quality we can afford, even when our budgets are cut. And with the help of information online, people have learned to shop around and pick the best deals from across all retailers. Shoppers began to plan more carefully, buying only what they need, not just in case. And shopping little and often has helped cut food waste. Somewhat surprisingly, the average shopper now makes 24 trips a month that involve purchasing food. And this has fed into another trend the extra three million unmarried pop people added over the last decade who
who tend to gravitate to small shops. No wonder the supermarket retailers began to prioritize smaller stores. And the independent retailers have kept raising their game, including farm shops. The discounters seize their opportunity. Over half of all of the shoppers now visit Aldi or Lidl in a given month. And the new customers have been pleasantly surprised by the quality and the shopping experience. Pound shops, freezer centres and warehouse-style discount centres have all flourished too. Meanwhile, shopping online became quicker and easier. It allows you to choose from any big retailer or Ocado or Amazon or other new services or to buy direct from producers. You can now click and collect from a store or many railway stations. Coffee shops, pizza deliveries, and many food-to-go outlets also grew out through the downturn. So although the supermarket format still rules the roost, and will do so for the foreseeable future, the landscape is now much more varied. The big retailers did see this coming, that's why they diversified, but the speed of change has taken everyone by surprise. So now, the pressure is on. Some supermarkets are closing, others are downsizing, and many new stores have been put on hold. All this drama reminds me of three golden rules that I've learned about markets. Firstly, they have the constant capacity to surprise, and conventional wisdom often turns out to be wrong. I heard this mentioned earlier as well, but I'm going to say it again. When the oil price went through the roof at IGD, we brought a group of energy experts together. They all agreed that the oil price would never drop below $100 a barrel. Well, so much for that. And conventional wisdom says that high-end companies lose out in recession. But when I was at M&S, Many, many years ago, our food sales always went up through the downturns, and Waitrose was a star performer during this last one. My second golden rule is that all market gaps are exposed and filled over time. If you're as old as me, I'm going to say, do you remember when the choice in ice cream meant either walls or lion's made? Yeah? That left a gap, and now there are local brands right across the UK, and many owned by farmers. The supermarket format claimed around 70% of the market five years ago. They did it by providing what shoppers want, but it left a gap, a gap for something different, and the discounters, online specialists, farm shops, and others have seized on it. My third rule of markets is that speed is much more important than scale. Ten years ago, most people thought that food retailer was all about getting bigger. And yet, it's the smaller companies recently who've been making the running here and in many other countries around the world. Of course, small businesses can also get set in their ways and get left behind. But this is an age for entrepreneurs, and farmers are some of the best entrepreneurs that I know. So I've looked at the past, I've looked at the present, and here are some predictions for the next five years. Most people will continue to buy most of their food from supermarkets, although by the end of this decade, the share of this format will be down to around 50%. The discounters will keep growing. People will eat out more often. Sales of convenience food will strengthen again, including food to go, or in other words, ready to eat. More shoppers will focus on quality, but the hunt for value, which is price and, and quality, will go on. The supermarkets will simplify their ranges, and their promotions, 
and they will end up leaning, running much leaner backroom operations. They'll innovate, they'll experiment to entice shoppers back to their big shops. They'll find ways to add excitement and variety to food shopping. Supermarkets will take on more of a cafe feel with areas to relax and taste products. And they'll lease out some of their space to attractive specialist retailers. With an aging population and the obesity challenge, health will be a rising concern. Online sales will keep growing. Amazon will play a bigger role in food. And click and collect will become even more popular. Looking further ahead, technology will play an even bigger role in our lives. And shoppers will be able to find out more about their food just by pointing their phones at a product. Our devices will also make recommendations as we shop and even buy some products for us automatically. So lots more change to come. But what does it mean for farmers? It will be disruptive and your customers will be as demanding as ever, maybe even more so. But I want to think positive. I can see four big opportunities for British farming and the first is to strengthen your partnerships. Volatility threatens the whole chain. The NFU is right to keep food security on the agenda. And IGD, we look at this closely, and so do retailers and processors. They know they need help to secure their future supplies. I last spoke here two years ago in the midst of the horse meat scandal, and now, we have another alarm about cumin and paprika. Food is big business, and fraud is a constant threat. Good long-term relationships raise the level of protection for everyone against volatility and fraud. They provide reassurance for consumers, and they're much more efficient. Stability, trust, and the sharing of information all help to root out waste and unnecessary cost through the chain. No one can afford to go it alone. Companies like Unilever and Nestle are building close partnerships on a global scale with their tea, coffee and chocolate growers. The business case gets more compelling to do this by the day. Partnerships, genuine partnerships, are the future for food chains. So don't wait to be asked. Take the initiative. Start the conversation with your customers. And think beyond the usual companies, because my second opportunity is to target growth markets. Food2Go is a good example where technical specifications can differ from the norm, with consistent quality more important than cosmetic appearance. The growing interest in health could actually be turned to your advantage. Food direct from the farm is natural and wholesome, and that's really worth shouting about. Farm shops and markets are well positioned for growth, given that people are now shopping around more and they're looking for excitement. Online farm farmers markets are all the rage in the US and are starting to take off here too. And there is scope to sell online in other countries. There's never been a better time to set your sights on exporting beyond the boundaries of Europe. And don't just rely on conventional wisdom. When the herd is heading one way, look for an, uh, look for an opening in the opposite direction. Or, as in the words of Mark Price of Waitrose, when everyone else zigs, they like to zag. The third opportunity is to help retailers add excitement to food shopping. They could really benefit from your product knowledge, your passion, and your personal touch. A Japanese retailer called Ito Yukado organizes days where farmers meet shoppers in stores. And I saw it for myself in Chengdu in China. It was really buzzing, and I believe it could work here too. I can even picture, because this is actually what I would do, I can even picture 
an independently run farm shop within the walls of a supermarket. It would add interest for shoppers, be a point of difference for those retailers who are up for it, and bring a new audience for farmers. My final opportunity is to keep raising your standards of traceability and transparency. I have one more golden rule about markets linked to this. People who act with integrity usually win out in the final reel. You have earned the trust of British shoppers, as IGD research proves. Nearly two-thirds of shoppers say that British farms tend to produce higher quality food and nearly as many people feel your hygiene and animal welfare standards are higher. Only one in six believe there's nothing special about British farms. And from a list of 14 professions, farmers are now the second best trusted with only doctors in front. So you should have a very receptive public for the new Gets My Vote campaign. Here are some other ways to build your reputation further. Keep building the Red Tractor brand. Bring it to life through more personal stories. Make the Farm Open Day for Leaf an even bigger event in the calendar. And since only 4% of people say they hear too much from farmers, nearly half say they don't hear enough. So showcase your farm through a website, social media, your local newspaper, or radio station. You will need to keep protecting your reputation, and you need to build it overseas. We don't want the next food scare to be from a British source. So vigilance and traceability are essential. And there's more work to do to convert your high trust into loyalty in store. Remember in future, our shopping choices may be semi-automated. Shoppers might have a prioritize British product setting on their smartphones. So you'll need to ensure that British products are always identifiable, including when they're ingredients. The sort of thing I have in mind is made using finest Norfolk Concerto barley on a label of a bottle of beer. I have to say, I don't drink beer, I prefer gin. But nevertheless, <laughs> the point, I think, is well made. Shoppers want variety and want authenticity. So the more you invest in segregating products, tracking data, the more opportunities you have to differentiate on locality, crop variety, livestock breed or, or production method, which helps insulate you from the vagaries of commodity markets. These volatile times are sure to bring up more ups and more downs. You'll need to weather more storms, but there are ways to shield yourselves. If you keep on adapting to the changing market, if you build stronger partnerships, if you apply high standards of integrity and demand them from others, and most importantly, if you focus fanatically on what consumers want, then I'll be feeling even more upbeat about the future for British farming. Your reputation is well-deserved. Your hand is growing stronger all the time. And the best, I'm convinced, is yet to come. Joanne, many thanks for that excellent presentation. And as you rightly say, British farmers have earned the trust of consumers. We're going to open it up now to, to questions. We've probably got 20 minutes. And if we could have David Shaw, Alan Warrington, and Simon Barton, you could come to your nearest microphone. Joanne, I'm just interested to kick questions off. Um, we've got retailers now charging 89p for four pints of milk. 
good marketing or devaluing of food? And what are your concerns for the wider food supply chain? Surely it puts massive pressure on that entire supply chain. If I take the second bit first, mm -hmm. I think everybody, as I suggested a few moments ago, is under pressure because I think the market in total, across a range of products, across retailers, food service operators, manufacturers, is undergoing a major structural shift. In terms of pricing, um, I'm going to come back to my point again that I made a few minutes ago. Uh, price is important to shoppers, but fundamentally, they're actually looking for value. And I would say, um, because it does is quite clear in our Shopper Vista research at IGD, that shoppers are absolutely tired of the blizzard of promotions. Um, and I think we will see some simplification. I think specifically on milk, and that's also true of, of some other product, products too, I think the, uh, the, the introduction of the discounters in the UK, having just gained some strength, and let's be clear here, um, the market share that they have is still relatively small, but in a mature market, it, it is a disruptor. And I think the major retailers they have their own strategies, um, but they feel, I think, that they probably have to respond to that in order to try and drive traffic back into the store. But I am a personal believer that um, relationships, good relationships up and down the chain, um, is of strategic importance and is the only way forward to manage the volatility. Um, and I think what I would like to see from everybody, actually, is a much longer term and strategic approach. I think in terms of pricing, over the coming months and years, you will see a change in that some of the retailers know that they have to differentiate their, themselves in other ways, and I think many of them are actually looking to do that. Thank but I can't John. give you a quick fix on it. Um, unfortunately, I'm not at the trading interface. <laughs> uh, Thomas, very quickly, do you have a view on, on devaluing a product, pressures on supply chains, surely? <clears throat> of course, uh, what we are seeing here is, of course, uh, the dairy products is being used as a driver to get customers into the shop. Uh, and um, I don't feel really comfortable with 88 pence for four pints. Now, I'm not exactly aware about four pints, if that is, you know, two litres, uh, two and a half litres. Yes, sorry. Um, it sounds awfully cheap, to be honest, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not probably not the best to ask about British retailing prices. <laughs> I'm good. If we take David Shaw first. Thank you. Thank you. Um, My question is a two-part question, and it's for Thomas, really. Um, and it, it's, do dairy processors um, really have any incentive to increase the sale price of their products when the soft option is to just cut the farmer's price, milk price? And following on from that, um, should, farmers have, should dairy farmers have a contract that states the quantity of milk they produce for a, for a given price, uh, for a formula price? Thank you. Thomas. Uh, yeah. Um, if dairy processors have an uh, incentive to increase milk price, uh, uh, I can talk from my own position, and uh, their milk price, internal milk price, is being discussed on a monthly basis. Um, business groups are being informed, especially when we can press prices up. And if we succeed in pressing prices up and getting a higher milk price, it's being paid out to our farmers. So I would say that uh, that is a cooperative working and it is an incentive to get a high milk price. Uh, contract on milk. Uh, Arla Foods have decided not to have A and B milk or specific quotas. Uh, we have uh, stated that we are ready to take the milk that our owners are supplying to us. Uh, and in that case, um, uh, it, is, it, is, it is a contract in the way that uh, we are promising to collect the milk and to pay for it, 
and the farmer are pro promising to deliver. Then there is a question about split deliveries and things like that. But basically, I would say we, 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 do not, uh, we do not have an intention of introducing these kind of contracts. If that is something which can work with private dairies, uh, I'm unsure of, uh, to be quite honest. Okay. All right. Thank you. If we could move on, a question on futures now from Alan Warrington. Hello. Um, Alan Warrington from Staffordshire. Uh, I'd like to ask Thomas uh, Carterson, uh, do we need a futures market in milk products? And if so, how can we set it up so that the individual farmer can participate? This is, this is the time where you normally reply, I think that is a really good question. Um, the futures market has been discussed uh, for many years, uh, and also there has been some attention, uh, mainly by Eurex here in Germany, or in Germany. Uh, we have also seen in New Zealand the stock exchange, together with Fonterra, have uh, opened up some indexes. Um, the problem with them all is that they are basically based on a commodity index, commodity pricing, uh, and it is not very really reliable, and they are not liquid. Uh, I think the good question is who should make these markets liquid? Who should make sure that there is a trading on these markets? Uh, if we leave it to the financial sector, I'm quite sure that the spread is going to, or the cost of doing the future is going to be pretty high. Um, I think that eventually we will arrive to it, but I'm not quite sure how the road is going to be, to be quite honest. Uh, I have discussed it with Eurex uh, for maybe four years. Uh, I just checked on the Eurex exchange uh, yesterday. Uh, there were zero offers uh, for 12 months going forward. So there was nobody setting a price on Eurex 12 months going forward. So that is not really a liquid market. The Chicago Mercantile Estate, the CME, is probably trading something like 2%, 2.5% of the U.S. milk. So it, I'm, I, don't, I have not cracked the code to who is going to make it work, to be honest. Can you set any time scale? No. <laughs> <laughs> An honest answer, at least. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we take the next question, if we could have James Small, Paul Brown, and Richard Yates to the microphone. Now we've got a question from Simon Barton. No, sorry, David Brooks. David, have you got a microphone? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. A question to first to Thomas Carterson. Anchor butter is now an Arla UK produced dairy product. Yet shoppers are hesitant to purchase it because of its perceived to be a foreign product. Can you do more to tell the UK shoppers that it's made from UK sourced and produced milk? Also, you as Arla, and probably myself as an Arla producer, still have an image problem within the UK dairy sector, which has resulted in a them and us attitude. Could I finally ask Joanne uh, Denny Finch a question? 50 years ago, a farmer would probably receive an income comparable to a doctor. You say we've got the same credibility as doctors. Can you see a time when we're going to have as inflated a salary as <laughs> doctors and GPs currently enjoy now? Thank you, David. <laughs> so, <laughs> An Anchor Butter, how do we let consumers know that it's British? Uh, I uh, have to say that I, I absolutely agree with you that we should uh, tell the consumers. I know that... Uh, our director of Isle of Foods UK is in the audience, so uh, I will not pass the question uh, to him, uh, but I will tell him uh, that it had been raised, <laughs> and uh, probably he should do something about it. <laughs> Thank 
you, Thomas. And, and Joanne, when could we be looking forward to, um, to receiving what doctors? Well, I'm not sure I can promise that uh, it will be the same salary as it doctors, but what I can say is I do genuinely believe that your time will come. Um, and I was speaking from the heart earlier, but I was also speaking from evidence. And I'm just going to say a few words which I think support that things will get better and your time will come. Trust, absolutely key for shoppers. Traceability, absolutely key for shoppers, country of origin. When I go out with shoppers, they're actually looking all the time. Um, at where foods come from and they want to know that it's fully traceable. Transparency, for me that's always about openness and honesty. Uh, food security, 19 strategic risks facing the food industry. Um, and I think that does mean that British farmers as we go forward will be in even more demand. And finally, I think I have to pick up on, on Myrig's point this morning about food self-sufficiency in this country. Um, shoppers want it. They want us to have greater self-sufficiency. And your greatest ally in all of this is the shopper. And if I can make one final point, which is linked to all of that, you have started an amazing dialogue with shoppers with your Gets My Vote campaign. But it's a start. The dialogue has to be continuous. You have to continue to talk to them through all of the channels that are available to you because you have what they want. And I think if you can really build this allegiance with shoppers, then the world is your oyster. And if the world is your oyster, then you will indeed command uh, higher prices. Joanne, thank you. This, this conference last year was told they would be driving Lamborghinis, <laughs> so that there is a, there's a long-term approach to uh, achieving doctor's salaries. Uh, Thomas has got a quick comment to make. Uh, yes, as an example on the uh, lean in Ala Foods, uh, I can tell you that we already have a bus now touring UK, 100 cities, uh, advertising that the anchor butter is from the UK. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Now, a, a very timely question on backing British from Simon Barton. Thank you. Following on from the comments that Joanne just made, the British poultry industry is very proud of its traceability. We can get the <coughs> message through to the British shopper, but not able to get it through to the consumer that eats ready meals and takeaway meals. How do we improve that? I think there's, there's a number of aspects um, to that particular question, and I think the thing that sort of strikes me immediately is McDonald's, because McDonald's seem to have done quite a good job on red meat, which is all about takeaway. So I think if you can emulate what McDonald's have done in, 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 in the poultry industry, then I think that's an important starting point I think if I had a strategy and I had to develop a strategy, I think I would be looking to target some really big companies who may well make a really big virtue out of selling uh, British raw material or ingredients for their products. And I think if you get traction, what you find is that peer group pressure comes into play. So I think we should all learn um, from perhaps the, the, mod the model that um, McDonald's have actually um, adopted. That having been said, it does work at the higher end of the market and it does work at the higher end of the market um, around the world. And I'll just give the Welsh a bit of a plug today because I was able to eat Welsh lamb in China recently and I was able to eat Welsh lamb in Dubai last week. Um, and they make a virtue of it. So I think it's about getting to the whole food service sector and it can work both at the bottom end of the market in, in the case of McDonald's, but it can also work at the top end of the market in some fairly swanky and schmaltzy restaurants. Thank you very much. I think we're running quite short on time, so if we can take these three questions, they're all specific to farm assurance, so if we take them all together and then have answers afterwards. James Small. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy President. It seems obvious to many of us that we need to open up and expand our export markets beyond the EU to limit the effects of the fall in euro and to benefit from the strengthening US dollar, and so to spread our risk of exposure to any one market. To this aim, what place does farm assurance schemes such as Red Tractor play to promote our produce abroad, and does it help to open and enhance these markets? Can we have the next speaker, please? Paul Brown. We'll take all three speakers and then answer afterwards. Thank you, uh, Paul Brown, Staffordshire. Um, my question was originally to consider similar to the previous one and ask uh, about the importance of UK farm assurance in the world market. And I was originally going to suggest to our industry that maybe we should boycott all farm assurance schemes and regain some control over how, to, how we want to run our farms. However, having listened to Joanne, if we are to accept the cost of ever more draconian farm assurance conditions, then how do we achieve much stronger branding rather than the often invisible logos that's seen on the back of much packaging? Lovely, thank you. And if we could take Richard Yates. Good evening. A continuation of the last question. Is the little red tractor running out of diesel? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, should we, should we start? Uh, perhaps, Dave, we haven't... Um, you, you've escaped <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, farm assurance. Obviously, for us, with the red tractor logo, it's our point of difference, and also the, the marker for stringent on-farm uh, assurance. Uh, as well as being obviously traceability and provenance that we heard the Secretary of State praising as a necessary for, ch for the Chinese market. Have you got a view on, on global uh, assurance schemes and the value that they add? I, I think the, the, the primary thing that we see is that this is a trend that's not going back. And you know, even when you look and being American and seeing what happened in Europe first with um, assurance of that it's sustainability, that the bio, um, organic, those types of programs. It was really a sought after thing and it was kind of poo pooed a bit and said, well, this is a, um, for, the, for the rich countries only. And we were in China a month ago and you see the same thing that's happening there where people want traceability. And you think about, we, we were saying this is so fast that it's moved to wanting that type of a, of a product in their, in their food, and they say, but look outside. So they're concerned about the environment because you look outside and you don't see anything because the, the pollution is so bad. So it it's, it's comes home, I think, at a faster pace there than it will in other places. So, you know, I, I think it, it's coming, it will come, and you stay the course on it. Thomas. Just picking up the, on the traceability, Traceability is one of the first questions being asked uh, by any industry when you're dealing with them. Uh, we have seen the food scandals in China uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so we definitely, uh, and, and whatever China is introducing is also in being introduced by Indonesia, or Manila, uh, Philippines, whatever. Uh, so you, know, you, you, you have a situation, you do not want to be in a situation where you've become ill from what you're eating. You know, that is not acceptable. So traceability uh, is not something which we can turn away or we can stop doing. On specifically the red tractor, uh, I, I don't have much uh, really insight into it. Uh, I showed you a picture from the Ivory Coast uh, with a Dano car in the wholesale market. I think the people in that market is probably not too much concerned uh, about the origin of the milk, if it's saying EU, I think they're pretty happy. Uh, but they are concerned about that it's healthy, it is, from, it is, it is clean, it's safe for their children. Uh, so I would say on export markets, it is very much difficult to uh, advertise one single, uh, one single uh, you know, uh, quality mark uh, in front of others. Uh, but by the end of the day, it is, it is a must that we are securing that we have the traceability and we have the quality, otherwise we can't export to any markets. Yeah. Thank you. And Dave, just one thing else, I think, on, on traceability that's very important in this 
is because you're talking about on a global scale that this happens. And that is that it has to be um, cost effective. So if you look at, at global food, you know, once you start adding cost to that supply chain, so it has to be done very efficiently, otherwise you risk, you know, the marginal consumer and the marginal producer, they're the ones that suffer by adapting a whole food system that's like that. So I do think, you know, it's, it's what people want, it's, but it has to, we have to find a solution where that, that costs are taken out of the system or not um, added on uh, inappropriately or to an excess so that we are impacting the marginal producer and the marginal consumer. Okay. And Joanne, finally, the, the last word to you. I mean, constant frustration, uh, Joanne, and the standards that we produce to. And then on shelf, you see commingling, uh, Danish pork on the same shelf as British pork, Irish beef on the same shelf as British beef, and New Zealand lamb and British lamb. You know, how do we? Uh, segregate this, you know, if we're going to champion, as you say we should, the British brand, the Red Tractor logo, uh, can we have your thoughts, please, on, on how we take that forwards? I think, I think what I would do is be leveraging right now the shopper. I'd be leveraging the public because it is consumers um, that actually drive marketplaces and drive choice. So I think, you know, come back to my point, you made a great first step with your campaign you have to build on that. And if I could just say one thing about um, the red tractor, which is the point about you know running out of diesel. It's only going to run out of diesel if you let it run out of diesel. Personally, I'd refuel it. And the reason I'd refuel it, I would, um, is because it has high shopper awareness. And I think the thing I would do is leverage that too. But I would be using shopper language um, rather than anybody else's language. So if you get close to shoppers and consumers and you use the language they use, then I would be playing it back in all of the marketing I did on the red tractor. In terms of point of sale, if 83% of shoppers say that they want British food, that's not a minority, is it? 42% say that they will actually pay a premium for local foods about 20% say they pay a premium for British foods. But I think if you tell your story, and it is about telling the story to create the demand, then you will find that retailers respond to consumers. Retailing is a response to culture. So if culture is changing, and it is, um, then you need to leverage it. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. It's, it's been fascinating to hear from, from these three speakers. I think in, in summary, uh, Joanne, you've said uh, refill the tractor. I think it needs uh, turbocharging. Um, January 2013, don't let's ever forget the Horsegate scandal that brought this country and the food industry to a standstill. And the red tractor and the independently audited supply chain held up throughout Horsegate. We've talked about quality and we've talked about value. Quality costs. Thank you very much to our speakers. Fascinating presentations. I really hope that we can take the theme on from what we've had today into tomorrow's political session and really challenge those politicians in that session. Yeah, I would just like to just go through this evening's schedule. So we've got a coffee break now, and then at 4 o'clock the commodity breakout sessions start followed at 6.45 by the drinks reception, and then at 8 o'clock, the dinner. So if we break for coffee now, thank you very much.